So have you thought about having a money date with your partner and have no idea where to start? Well, I have created a fun exercise that the two of you can do. It's called a financial will and you can do an exercise and it's really great strategy or tool to start having conversations with money with your partner. So go into the show notes and download the workable exercise and just have fun with it. Hello and welcome to the RAS Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Hello and welcome back to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Campbell, and today I'm talking to wonderful behavioral money coach, former financial advisor and friend of the podcast, Karen Ely. Welcome to the show, Karen. Hi, Kate. Thanks for having me. Now, today, following on from our previous episode, we dropped, uh, should have been about a week ago, where we were talking about some of those mindset blocks that hold us back when we're working on our finances. I thought it would be a really good idea to talk about couples and money because we get so many people writing into the podcast saying, how can I get my partner on the same page when it comes to our finances or help? We've got different financial goals or We just want to start working on our finances together. And so I thought you would be the perfect person to come on to talk about why it's important for us to speak about money in our relationship and how to get started at any point. Some of the reasons why we find it hard, because a lot of us do find it hard even just to talk about money with our own friends, let alone our partner. And then how to start this money conversation. And you've also put together a really cool exercise we can do on our next money date with our partner be called your financial wheel of life. So I've tried this exercise, so I'll share what I'm going to work on. Uh, And this is a good exercise for anyone, whether you're in a relationship or not. This is a fantastic one. Yeah, absolutely. So I highly recommend doing the exercise uh, and we'll walk through it during the episode today. Yes. And if you stop listening now, you'll miss out on all of the goodness to come when we talk about this financial wheel of life and how to create really positive actions with your own finances. So I would stick around, even if you're not in a relationship, this is still going to be a really helpful episode for just having money conversations and working on your finances generally. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good exercise to start, even if you want to doing some financial goal setting because it gets you really focused on what are those particular areas because we're going to talk about 12 different areas in the financial wheel, um, which are the ones that I really want to focus on the next six months, 12 months. Okay, wonderful. Now, Karen, why is it important for couples to be on the same page when it comes to money? There's a couple of reasons. The first reason is that you want to be moving in the same direction when it comes to our finances. Otherwise, it can kind of feel a little bit like we're kind of moving ahead and then someone's putting the handbrake on because we, we're we wanting different things and moving in direction, uh, different directions. So, you want to be kind of aligned when it comes to our money. The second reason is that you want to be on the same page is there's research to show that it's the second biggest cause of marriage or relationship breakdowns is because of finances. So you don't want your money to be ruining something that's really valuable, like a relationship. Okay. So if we want to avoid that happening, I think it's important to tackle some of the the common challenges because that might be something that brings up different thoughts and feelings for people listening today because they might go, hey, I've had some of those challenges, but I really want to work on them. How can we do that? So when couples come to you for money coaching and talk about some of the challenges they're having with money, what do you see popping up time and time again? So the most common one that I see, Kate, is that differences about spending. So it might be that one person is really focused on saving and putting away for the future and the other person is more focused and, and creates or has more value around short-term spending and wanting to have fun and living for today. So that can create a lot of conflict because when you've got one wanting to put money away and then the other one that just wants to, hey, let's just have a good time with it, it creates a lot of angst between a couple. That's the first one. The second one is differences around their risk tolerance. So you might have one person in a couple that is really cautious and safe and wants to keep all of their money in cash or a term deposit. 
And then you've got someone else that really sees the value in investing to create wealth. And so they want to invest in shares and property. And so when you've got those shared finances, one person's wanting to keep safe and the other person's wanting to take risk, it can cause anxiety on both ways. Like one is we're not going to get ahead if we're just being cautious. And the other one is I'm really scared that we're going to lose this money if we invest it. So that's the, the next one that I see. Another one really comes down to different responsibilities. So sometimes there can be a financial dominant that they kind of lead the way and they're responsible for managing the cash flow, paying the bills, thinking about long term, putting away for the future. And then the other person might be quite disengaged. And so their default is to do nothing and it's like, well, my partner's going to take care of it. They're going to do it. So I might do other things in the relationship, but I'm just going to leave the money to them. So that can create resentment from the person that feels like they're having to do everything, but it can also cause anxiety and insecurity for the person that's not doing anything because they don't really have an awareness of what's going on. Or sometimes it can play out a little bit different where one person in the relationship is really in control of everything and not letting the other person contribute and um, being a little bit secretive, not knowing how much is in the bank account or even how much the other person earns or controlling how much decision-making they have when it comes to their finances. Some of that stuff can be quite challenging to deal with, especially if it goes beyond maybe just an argument about should we spend the money today or should we spend it in the future? And sometimes you might need assistance outside of what we can talk about on a podcast and we'll put some resources in the show notes. But if we are in a relationship where it's safe to start having a conversation about money, it might feel scary because we haven't done it before, but we're in a place that we're safe to have these conversations. How do we start a money conversation with our partner? So I've got a couple of tips to share, Kate. So the first one is requesting a time. So just checking in with your partner and saying, hey, I'd like to have a chat about our cash flow or about our superannuation or about those goals that we have. When would be a really good time for you? And so you put it to the other person to let them have some control and autonomy around, all right, well, let's meet on the weekend or after work or on a lunch break or something like that. Let them have the choice on when they actually catch up and and chat about it. So that gives them time to think about it as well if they need to prepare anything, whether that be mentally or physically. So not springing it on them. Exactly. Yeah. So giving them some notice. I think a lot of us probably want a bit of time to prepare for that conversation because it's like that thing in the office when your boss says, hey, can we have a chat at 2 p.m. today? And you spend the whole day going, what is this chat at 2 p.m. today? And then they're just like, oh, I just am really happy with your progress, but you're worrying that you're about to be made redundant or something like that. Absolutely, because our brain is constantly looking out for fear. So it's like it's going to go to the default of, oh, what have I done wrong or what's I'm in my own trouble. And so when you are asking to have that conversation, it's like can we put some time away, explain the reason why. Yeah. So it's kind of like alleviating some of that anxiety, Uh, hopefully, maybe Mm. not. But Maybe I'd really like to talk about Um, saving up for our next trip together or how we're going to start working towards our house deposit or I really want to start working on our superannuation. I've been listening to some resources. I've got some ideas. I'd love to bounce them off you. Yeah, absolutely. Or it might be something around, well, the cost of living of everything's going up, uh, money's a bit tight. I'd really love to have a chat and let's kind of brainstorm about maybe how we can allocate money a little bit differently for a while or whatever that topic is. Just let them know what they're in for so they can prepare emotionally and and logically around, around that. It's really helpful. All right. The other thing you had in your list on starting a money conversation was starting the conversation with why. Yeah, your why. So that is really about what's your intention for that conversation? Is it so we can get on the same page? Is it that you're feeling stress or anxious about something that you'd like to unpack and and see if we can work through this? Or it might be something more positive around, uh, yeah, we want to go on a holiday. It's only six months away. We haven't really done anything yet. My intention is that we can walk away after a discussion with a plan and we're both going to commit or take responsibility for certain things. So it's about, yeah, just really being clear on, on your purpose, but then also communicating that, 
yeah, what, what would you like to get out of this conversation as well? I think the other interesting thing in the money conversation is talking about both individual and shared goals because sometimes clashes can come up there where you can't really reach every financial goal you want within the next 12 months. So things have to be prioritised. Yeah, absolutely. And it's prioritised and compromise sometimes. So we've all got a certain amount of resources and it's about how we allocate those and, and having conversations. I think it's really important for a couple to have goals, shared goals as a couple. So you are moving in the right direction, but you also want to have your own personal goals and you want to feel like your partner is supporting you in those goals as well. And it may not be financial support at the moment if that's not what it can be, but it might be emotional support or time support or learning support. Yeah. And I think that will tie really well into the financial wheel of life we get into a little later because that will help articulate what both of your individual goals are as well and where you might be differing. The next thing you have on the list is talking about financial fears, which I think ties in really well with the episode we did last week on money blocks. And what are some of those things that might be stopping both of you from working forwards on a goal together? Mm. I think it's really important to express our fears because we might be looking at our partner doing certain things and thinking, why are they doing that? It's normally coming from a place of fear. So you want to be able to have them articulate and and you think on your fears as well. So when you ask a question of what's your greatest fear around this from a financial point of view, have your own answer too. What's your greatest fear? And it might be that I don't feel like we're taking action or we're making enough progress and I fear that we will have to work longer than we should because of that. Or the fear might be around we work so hard but we're not actually enjoying it and it's really important that we just take some time to to spend and enjoy and, and, and yeah, have money being a bit more fun than it is. Mm. And it might even be more helpful to go first and share your theatre to open up that conversation. Yeah, Um, because it can be quite vulnerable. So we have this fear, uh, but to be able to express it and share it and feel like you can do it in a really safe environment where you feel validated, we don't want a response to be, oh, that's so stupid. Why are you scared of that? That is not the approach that we want to take. We want to validate and say- It's a quick way to shut someone down. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So it's about validating that fear or maybe having some empathy. I'm really sorry that you feel that way and and based on those experiences, I can totally validate why you have that fear. So how can I support you that you feel safe around this? The other really interesting question you have- when it comes to having money conversations with your partner is where do you see us financially in 10 years' time? Because that really pushes you and your partner to think beyond the next 12 months and maybe what the broader vision is that you want to work towards, even if it's not crystal clear, because most of us uh, do not really know where we're going to be in 10 years' time. That's right. And, you know, we have these cognitive biases or the way that our brain kind of shortcuts things. And our brain is hardwired to be focused on the short term rather than the long term. So by having a conversation with your partner, it's like, where do you see us in five years, 10 years time? Start to vision it, put words to it. Well, I see that we will have purchased our house together or maybe we're closer to paying off the mortgage or we've been on a holiday or we're going to start a family or we're planning for our retirement and our retirement's going to look like this. Just really kind of looking out to the future and creating a vision or a roadmap for the two of you together. And then you can kind of go from there. It's like, well, what are the things we need to do today to set ourselves up for in 10 years' time? Because I love that quote, if you want shade today, you needed to have planted that tree 10 years ago to get that shade. So, But uh, the next best time is to plant it today. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that lines perfectly into the financial wheel of life because it's all about assessing where you are right now, thinking about where you want to go and taking action. And I've gone through it myself. I think it's a perfect tool. If you want to talk to your family, your friends, your partner about money, you can start to Think about where you are right now, where your friends and family are, and there's lots of different categories. So if anyone can see on YouTube, I'm going to hold it up to the camera. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, maybe. But uh, you can see that there's different 
sections of the wheel. Now, I'll get Monique to do something clever and superimpose the photo (laughs) over my face right now. Um, And we'll also share it in the show notes so people can download this PDF worksheet to go through. But can you talk us through the financial wheel of life exercise, Karen? Yes. So you'll be seeing a wheel and it's segregated into 12 different elements, which is essentially every aspect of our finances. So there's family, there's career and income, investing, retirement, mindset, our emotions, fun, spending, friends, debt, security, and tax. So there's 12 different elements there. And so what you want to do as an exercise, whether you do it on your own or do it as part of a couple, if you're doing as part of a couple, you still want to do your own assessment of it. So You'll see the exercise, you'll see the 12 areas there. And what you want to do is you want to score it out of 10. So you want to give every one of those 12 elements a score out of 10 in terms of your satisfaction and confidence. Like how do you feel about this particular area of my finances? And so you'll score it 0 or 1 for being very low and concerning and not confident or not satisfied, and up to a 10 if it's like, yep, this is going fantastically. I'm going to give that 10 out of 10. Couldn't be any better. So you go through each of the 12 elements and score it from 0 to 10. Yeah, and I think it's really important to be honest with yourself during this exercise because you could go, yeah, I'd love to be a 10 when it comes to investing, but honestly I'm actually a 3 right now, Hmm. and that's okay. We just want to be aware of where we're at. That's right. It's not like a report card you need to give to your parents that are going to say it's just for you and maybe to help it start as a conversation starter for you and, you know, your partner. So, yeah, agree. Be really, really honest with where are you scoring that. And don't expect to have tens for everything. So when I get clients to do this, sometimes there'll be a one or a two on half of the areas and then maybe a five or a six, it doesn't really matter so much about your score today, but it's about this is where you're starting from and you're starting the journey here and that's okay. Okay. So once we've scored, and this might take a while of sitting down and reflecting and thinking about where we're at, once we've ridden a score in each spoke of the wheel, is Mm, that what it is? Let's call it a spoke. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That doesn't sound very glamorous. I don't know. (laughs) Slice of the wheel. I don't know. Once we've written down a score for each of these 12 areas, what do we do next? So then it's a show and tell. So you and your partner sit down together and go through each element. So what you're wanting to see here is are the two of you aligned? So you're both scoring a 6 or a 7 or an 8 out of 10 for family. Uh, I use both scoring a similar amount for income or career. So what you're wanting to do is acknowledge and identify and celebrate the areas where you feel like you're aligned and you've got a similar score. Then what you want to do is have a look at, well, what are the differences and disparities? And they're the ones that are really good to start a conversation. So you might have one around, say, income, for example, one person scored 8 out of 10. They're really satisfied and confident in their income income earning ability and their career. And the other person might have scored a three out of 10. And so be curious around, tell me more about the three. What's coming up for you? What is it that you're not satisfied? What would make this a five out of 10? How can I support you? What, what, tell me more about where this scores come from. And that can really start a conversation around um, their challenges, why they're not feeling satisfied or confident. And then we can kind of move into and we talk about the the other side of it, about creating certain actions around that. But, yeah, so you want to kind of have a look at where are the disparities or differences in going through each area and just asking, well, tell me more about that. Um, and then from there, when you've gone through all 12, the two of you want to agree on let's just prioritise five of those. So some might be scoring okay or maybe they're all low scoring. Well, let's pick five that we're going to focus on for the next six months. I think this is a really good exercise to uncover, as we talked about in that last episode, those money beliefs that we might have that we're not really aware of. We might be able to uncover things about ourselves and our partner of where we're at right now with our lives and with our finances 
that we're not aware of because we might not have spoken about these things or even thought about it. And when we actually sit and reflect and we go, hey, I, I feel really anxious about my financial position right now. I, I think I'm a three or a four in that security area. Mm-hmm. And then maybe the partner's thinking really differently about security and thinking, oh, well, I'm, I've got enough. I'm making enough to sort of cover all the bills and expenses. And you can even see differences in mindset to do with things like that when you notice really different scores when you've got the same level of income and yeah um the security one is the one where i see the biggest difference between a couple and because it is about perception of security as well as your definition of security so when i ask clients what level of money in the bank makes you feel like you're safe and secure And for some people, it's $1,000. If I've got $1,000 in there, I feel really safe and secure. I've got a bit of a net there. Other people, that might be, I need $50,000. And until I've got that, I feel really unsafe. Yeah. And I think this exercise also reminds you that it's about more than just the income. All of these areas of the financial wheel impact your life and how you're satisfied you are and how confident you are with making decisions. So if you've got a lot on your plate when it comes to your family, that might impact you in making other good financial decisions in your life. Yeah, correct. Family's a really interesting one too. So it's do I get to spend enough time with my family? And if you've got a a primary breadwinner that's working full-time or maybe more than full-time hours, they might score that really low to say, well, I just don't feel like I have enough time with our children, with you, and the other person might have it as quite high. And so what are some things that we can put in place? How would, how could we increase this score for you or to make you feel like um, that you've got more time for the family? Or it might be that you um, have parents or siblings that just need a bit of extra financial support from you and you want to be allocating some of your surplus income or your savings capacity to help them and starting that conversation around, well, how can we support other extended family members as well? So it can play out in lots of different ways, Kate. Yeah. And it's great to just write this down. I think this is the one time where I'd make an exception and actually print out this document. So you can go on that money date, whether you're at a bar or you're at a coffee shop or you're just sitting outside in the backyard and go through and look at each of your numbers and be really curious, not just why you're feeling certain things about different areas of your life, but why your partner's feeling that as well. And be really curious and ask questions without any judgment to just get to know where they're at, why they're thinking these things. Yeah, I love that you use the words curiosity rather than judgment because people are going to come with different insecurities, uh, different fears, maybe shame or guilt that they should be at an eight and they're really only a three. So we want to have a lot of compassion and empathy and and curiosity and ask, I'm really curious about that. Tell me more about that. Um, Can you explain how that's concerning for you? Uh, And to be able to support them in a really compassionate, safe way rather than going to judgment and criticism. Yeah. So once we've discussed all of these different numbers and we're ready to turn over to the next page, where do we go to here? Because this page is called Taking Action, which is something we talk about all the time on the finance podcast. You've got to do more than just know the thing. You actually have to do something about the thing. Mm, Absolutely. So the first thing to do is to decide as a couple, what are our five focus points for the next six months or 12 months or three months, whatever time frame that the two of you agree to. So pick five and it might be one on from each of yours that scored really low that is a really big concern and the others might be some joint ones. That, so these are things that we can do together. So you pick your five categories and write them out and then you've got your score there. So this is the score today and then you can put in the same box, where do I want to be? So if I'm a four now, and I want to be at a seven, what do I need to do to get there? So what you want to do is articulate that as a goal. And so maybe you've scored low on debt and that's a bit of a concern and you've got some credit card debt or some personal loans that you want to pay off. And so that might be a three at the moment and you'd really like to get it to a six. So that goal might be in six or 12 months' time to have paid that debt off. And so that is the goal attached to the category. And then what are the actions that I need to take? And those actions, Kate, might be reviewing our cash flow 
to see where can we cut back in some areas so we've got more cash flow to allocate to paying off that debt and making that a priority. Just for six months, 12 months, we're really going to focus our time and money on getting this goal down, um, this debt paid off, so we can increase that score in that area. Yeah. I really like that because it breaks it down so well and it stops you from writing too many goals that you're overwhelmed and forces you to go, well, I'm only picking maximum five categories I want to work on. If that's too much, maybe I just pick two or three. Yep. That's the, my priority right now. How I want to increase that from a three to a even a 3.5 over the next few months, what my goal is, and then what is one small thing I'm going to do this month to get there? Because we can often say, I want to start investing or I want to reduce my spending. But if we don't attach any small action step to that, well, that can be on our to-do list for years before we do anything about it. Mm, absolutely. And so when the two of you agree to these are the goals that we've got, this is the time frame, and these are those small steps, let's check in in a fortnight or a month or in two months and reassess and have a look, have we actually done those action steps that we committed to? Mm, there's got to be some check-in and accountability there. Mm, that's right. So with those categories, when when it was my intention when putting them together that we do have five. It might be that two or three, like you said, they're going to be the short-term ones. So they're going to be ones that we want to do in six months, 12 months, but there might be one there that might be at the bottom and it's a goal over the next five years. So it's kind of on our vision that it's something that we want to change. And so that might be the action required. So if we use the, um, the retirement one, and superannuation, well, it's about checking our investment options or our fees. And it might be that one action that we need to take and then we don't really need to do anything for the rest of the year and we can focus on those shorter-term goals up yeah. the top. And then is this something you would – so some of the goals might be multiple months or multiple years. Would you then come back on your money date each month and go, well, what's the next small action I need to do in the next month to keep working towards increasing this score? Absolutely. So it's all about crossing one thing off. What's the next thing that we need to do or I need to do? I'll just share one of mine as an example. I haven't been able to invest much this year because I've been working part time while I finish my JD, which has been going on forever, but I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. So I said I was sort of a six there and I wanted to get up to a seven. And so my goal was to make an investment before the end of the year because I haven't been able to invest much, but I've got a little bit of money left over. So my small action was by the end of this year, invest $500 into my ETF portfolio. So I, it was a smaller goal. It was maybe shorter term, mm. but just something small that can get me moving and make me feel a bit more satisfied with my investments because it's something I've been working on for such a long time and building up. And so having to press pause for a while is a little bit tricky and I know it's for a good reason and I've got a good reason for doing it and I've got a plan for unpausing longer term. But I think just to make me feel a bit more satisfied and confident, I'd like to make a small investment by the end of the year. Yeah, that's such a great one. And I think it's great that you've acknowledged that, yeah, it's it's not where I want it to be, um, but these are the reasons why. But hey, I'm going to take that step anyway and it might be a smaller step than you'd like to and $500 for someone else, it might be $50 or $10, but it's about taking that first step and taking action. It changes our mindset and it just feels like we're making progress. We always just want to feel like we're progressing in the right direction. So if you are doing this with a partner, should these five goals be the same or would you write some of your own and some shared? Because I can imagine with things like career, they might be different. Yeah. So I think for couples to be on the same page, you've got your own individual wheel on the one side and then I think together have five. So rather than having five each, have five together and it might be that one is your responsibility and that's your area where you're feeling really low if we use a career example and then the other person might be, well, actually, we do want to start investing. We've not ever done it before. So my action items are going to be researching a broker or looking at some ETFs and that, that's kind of my action. And then the third one might be around uh, debt and that's something that we share and so we're going to work on that one together. How can we find some extra cash flow to or sell something that we don't use anymore to start 
reducing the debt down. So I think it's good to have your own individual ones and then shared ones, but just keep to five because otherwise we're going to get too overwhelmed and we'll do nothing. (laughs) I can imagine. I think this could also be, I don't know if anyone would be brave enough to do it, but a really fun exercise to do with a group of friends um, maybe over pizza one night and actually just go through do the exercise and then work on your goals and come up with some action points and then share them together and work with each other and you can hold each other accountable. I mean, if anyone does this with this, their friends, I would love to know because I think it could work really well if you are a close group of friends. Yeah, you can have like a finance club or like a money group or something <laughs> like that. Oh, maybe don't need to go that screaming far. Club, that screaming fun times. <laughs> but um, I, I'm not going to completely stuff up the statistics but it's been written that uh if you want to achieve a goal you're 40 percent more likely to achieve it if you write that goal down so we're getting you to write that down and then if you actually tell someone else about it that 40 percent increases to 72 percent or something like that so to actually share it with someone else it, it creates an accountability mechanism which uh can be really really helpful to taking action Yeah, because then if I share this with a friend, even if I take a photo and send it to them and in whatever the time frame I defined, they'll go, well, have you done this action? Mm. If if not, why not? Yeah. What's stopping Um, you? What's holding you back here? What do you need to learn to do this action? Yeah, and how can I support you? Is there anything I can do to help you? Uh, I tell lots of my friends different goals that I'm doing and sometimes I'll go, oh, have you done that, Karen? I'm like, mm, not yet. And they'll just make it into a joke. They're not going to be kind of like getting their finger out and <laughs> cross you telling me off. It's like, all right, okay, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to keep asking you until it's done. So I'm like, all right, that's kind of puts a stone in my shoe to take action. So yeah. Sometimes we need that extra motivation that we – Yeah, sometimes you need a person to remind you, hey, you said this was really important to you and you wanted to do it. Why? You need a bit of tough love sometime. I think with finances, sometimes it can be easy to put off sorting out your super for years and years. And if your friend gave you a little bit of tough love today, well, you could actually make sure you had thousands more dollars in your super long term. Mm, That's the thing, isn't it? Time and money go so well together and just delaying doing something by six months, 12 months, it can turn into several years. Um, We want to avoid doing that. So if we can put mechanisms and strategies into place that help us keep progressing, that's going to give us great outcomes. Awesome. Well, is there anything else we need to know? Because we've kind of gone through the activity and how everyone can complete it. No, I just think have a bit of fun with it as well. It doesn't have to be kind of like a drudgy thing to do. Uh, it's a will, make it fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, just have some fun with it, I think. But um, I really do like your approach to printing it out and I think even putting it somewhere, like I've got clients that like put it on their fridge magnet and so yep. they just see it every day so they can just check in with their partner or if they're on their own, just check in with themselves. Have it somewhere printed out and visual where you're going to have that reminder and that prompt. If you're not into printing out things, diarize it in your calendar so whether it be a check-in or whether it be diarizing those action steps that you're going to take so if it's in my calendar I'm going to do it if it's not we'll find other things to fill that time yeah yeah you actually need to make time to take these actions absolutely and also check in on yourself and set the next action for the following month but I think it's a really simple clean way of setting out what you want to work on what your goals are and making sure you don't come up with a list of 30 goals which I've been known to do in the past (laughs) (laughs) yes no more than five people yep keep it simple well Karen, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing this exercise with us. It will be linked in the show notes for everyone. Um, If you're watching on YouTube, we'll have also put a link in the description so you can download that and get started. And I think it'd just be a fantastic exercise. If you want to share some of your findings or your action points with us, jump into the RAS community and let us know and let everyone know what you're working on and we can help keep you accountable. Wonderful. Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Kate. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more. Thank you.